stubborn ass We can put our heads together and move <laughs> Or one of your kids, maybe, <laughs> you know, whoever yeah. it is, or your nan, or you know, somebody that. Yeah, and it's. Decide. Yeah, and that's a playful kind of smack in the butt. Maybe that's part of it too. <laughs> yeah, thankfully, thankfully, I've got a lot of friends, who um, have been doing that same for me because, uh, just recently, I got the results back from the first round of this author versus author contest that I'm taking part in, or was taking part in. Uh, and looking back on it now critically and uh non-emotionally i can see where the judges are saying it was really hard to decide but this is why i voted for x right and saying that both authors were really good i really like the story they played off of each other because you basically the first author would write a chapter i would write the next chapter and we would write a book that way and so since I was the second person, I was basically playing catch up the whole time, which it was a lot harder, I will say that, than me being the one controlling the story. They had control of the story from the get go. They had control of the, the tense, the point of view, all of that stuff. And so if I tried taking it in a different direction, they could easily take it right back. So I always felt like I was struggling throughout mm -hmm. the whole thing but it was also a learning experience i learned how to write in a different point of view intense through it but when they pointed out well this is why i chose it because there was like a critical error of you used u of o instead of university of oregon or you used hwy instead of highway things like that <clears throat> and so looking at it critically i'm like okay we were almost tied but because of these reasons, they decided to go with the other person. And yet when I looked at it the first time, all I saw was the author B, because I was author A, but I went second for some reason. Uh, the author B got all five votes. I didn't get a single vote. So even though all in the judge's explanations, it was really, really close. Seeing the author B won five to zero mm. just crushed me. And I wrote up this thing about why do I even bother trying? I, I can't be successful. I can't even get past the first round of an author versus author contest. And people like Atticus Blake just walked in there and went, Pah! <laughs> stop it. And it was, it was that smack upside the head that, got me to actually go back and look at it critically and getting, getting criticized yeah. i could say from from experience you know i go through uh peer review and and also being on the other side of peer review too uh as you say you know it's um hearing criticism is especially initially you know i think with our education system it's very difficult because from at least you know most of my american education i did very little writing of essays it was mostly multiple choice and fill in the blank and true false and that kind of testing you know we didn't so when i went to the british system it was a shock to me that uh the way that they did their their marking was that the undergraduate students had to do you know two or three three thousand word essays they had to write you know <laughs> and, and that yeah. and that kind of surprised me and when you're a uh, when i was a student i would sort of get my marks and i would i didn't always look I, you know, in my master's degree, I actually, I did, um, I didn't get the mark I wanted on an essay. And I went to talk to the professor of the course. And he said, it took you a while to get going. If you go read a journal article, you'll see that they cover information, you know, very quickly, and they kind of get going faster. And, and you just took a while to get going. And I, I pretty much got, I mean, I think I ended up a, a half a point off of a distinction in my master's. I was ripped off, by the way. Uh, that's a longer story, but I should have gotten a first. Um, but external reviewers made um, one of other professors take everybody's marks down 10 because he thought they were too high and uh, otherwise anyway so um, about the idea of, of writing and then getting feedback and writing again wasn't really because you know in, in university if you write an essay you don't rewrite it to get a higher mark 
you just do, you start over on the next one. And, you know, you hope you learn from the mistakes from the first one. I actually think it would be better if we made students rewrite their essays until they were all A's or distinctions, because then they would know what a distinction looks like and why it looks like that. And that's what I found through the peer review process, because there's no mark, you know, it, and, and nobody sends an article to an academic journal and just gets it accepted without changes. Are you kidding? <laughs> like, you give something to three academics, they're going to have something to say about what you've given them, especially when it's their job. And, mm -hmm. and so the first time, because, you know, to get into the peer review system, you have to submit articles and then they get your name once you get published there or you send a couple articles there and you've gotten published somewhere else and then they look for free work from, from you. But uh, the first two pieces... Um, were accepted after revision. So we got an R&R, &R, revise and resubmit. And the first time I got a straight up rejection, I was absolutely crushed because I hadn't gotten a rejection before and it was really difficult. And you go through it, you know, you have whatever, however you console yourself, if you cry or you just like spend the day to press, whatever else. But of course you want to get it published. So at some point you have to read those comments. And then when you do the R&R, &R, sometimes, you know, you have to make big changes or uh, think about the way you're presenting it. And eventually, if you can get to the point where you've kind of got this expectation, if you look forward to the criticisms rather than fear them, and this took me a while, then when they come, you can be a little bit more strategic about, okay, here's how I can do this to make the paper better. And I've known, because I had some really good reviewers, that there are pieces of mine that are published that are definitely much better than the original version because of the thoughtful comments of a reviewer who made suggestions that really brought like a clarity to something or helped us present the data in a way that was more accessible. And those, mm -hmm. those kind of contributions are really valuable, even if they aren't always couched in the nicest language. You know, they don't always give you the shit sandwich of saying something nice, saying something, uh, what's wrong with it, and then closing with something nice. A lot of times it'll just be this is all the things that you need to fix. <laughs> gets a little bit brutal, gets a bit German in that way. Yeah. But um, now I'm on the other side where I'm doing a review and I sent it back for R&R &R, and they sent it back to me. It's still not good enough. And I thought about, you know, the, the impact of getting that second R&R &R when you're really hoping to get the accept. But I also know the piece isn't ready. It's just not ready. And if they do the things that I'm telling them, it's going to read better because it's way too, yeah, I don't want to get into specifics, but it's, it's, it's overly wordy. The data could be presented in, in more efficient ways um, from what they did last time. And if they stick with me, at the end of the day, they're going to have a much better article than the first one they submitted. Um, but it's a hard process that requires kind of, you know, swallowing a little bit of pride and taking some advice or um, focusing, you know, dealing with the, cr the criticisms. And, and we don't really do a good job of teaching people in our education system how to do that because of the grading system. You just get a value and you either feel good about yourself or eh, I don't care or you feel bad about yourself and you move on. But there's nothing there to help you and redo it and improve. And I think it's a it's a real waste of our educational resources to do that. Because I think if, if kids had the opportunity to redo their work, redo the spelling test until they got the words right, you know, it, if it takes that seven tests, it takes seven tests, but they'll get there. Um, I know that's probably a very decadent way of doing education, but I think it would make a big difference. And I, maybe as a writer too, you know, you're learning about the value of dealing with with criticism as you were saying yeah um and that that's actually something that's for me because I've, I've sent off my manuscript to publishers and i only received back one letter saying we reviewed your because i got really good at writing query letters but and i've actually gotten <laughs> decent at writing synopsis the the joke among writers is an, is and then satan said make them write a synopsis uh so i've gotten decent at that stuff but all of these places that are like okay we accept unsolicited uh submissions you don't need a literary agent all that stuff i followed through all the steps that they required and all i got was a little notice saying declined and that's all it would say was just declined, 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 declined. And when 
and the thing that I have it on, it's on authors.me, which tells you if they have actually accessed your profile, if they've accessed your query letter, if they've accessed anything. And I know that it works because I have one that's actually shown that they've accessed these various things. So just seeing that decline over and over again with no, hey, maybe if you fix this or resubmit by fixing this or the one that actually did send something back said, we really enjoy your story, but the genre doesn't fit with what we are going for right now. So Do it you was know of, uh, Smashwords, which is a self-publishing uh, online business. Yeah, I, I currently have my stuff up on Inkit. Uh, which is uses an app and everything. Now I haven't used Smashwords. I I originally, I this is a new manuscript, but originally when I published my first two stories, it was self publishing through uh, Create Space. So I've I've gone through those things. Okay. But uh, yeah, Smashwords. I have a little. When I started learning German, I decided a good way to learn it would be to write a little book. So I paired up with a native German speaker, and we wrote little stories. Um, and translated them, you know, and so that they're identical in English and German. And I put it up on Smashwords, and it doesn't sell that many copies because you got to be a very niche kind of person to want to read A1 level German stories. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have a lot of them. That's why I made it because I was looking for books that I could read at that level, and there just weren't that many books out there that also had an English translation. So I worked up one and I, and I wrote one. But they're really good about distributing to iTunes and all of the other um, Amazon and all of the other digital systems so that you can find my book on iTunes, for instance, and download mm -hmm. it. Yeah, because yeah, I, for me, I, I enjoy cr constructive reviews. I, I actually, when, when I write stuff, that's what I want. I would love to hear gushing praise about my stuff. Who doesn't? But like when I, when I write, uh, one, of the, one of the big reviews that I've gotten back from friends and family has been, your opening feels like we're missing a chapter. And so that's what I've been working on fixing lately, is trying to fix that opening. But when, when I work on it in general, it's like, okay, I self-edit, I've got all the books, I've got all the training, all that fun stuff to self-edit. But it's it's the flow and the syntax. And if I can get feedback, I really appreciate it. It's when it's constructive feedback, I should say. When it's yeah, yeah. your story sucks or you write at the level of a second grader and I gave up reading it. Those are the ones that actually crush me and hurt me. The constructive ones I appreciate. And in, in middle school and high school, so this was 1994 to 2000, we had constant writing assessments. Like just every couple months we had a writing assessment where we were given a topic and we had to write about it. And then it was sent before a panel of three people and they reviewed it. And we got back our scores. Yay. And I was always scoring really, really low. And they never really explained much aside from grammatical errors. And so I didn't learn how to get better. And in ninth grade, because of my low writing scores, my English teacher wouldn't let me move on to world literature. I actually took that my senior year. I, I took uh 12th grade english and world lit on my senior year so i was doubling up on classes but she told me that because of my writing scores i wouldn't be able to comprehend the material provided even though i had been reading what yeah that was what she told me she pulled me out and said i'm not okaying this because of what i just said and it it actually made me stop writing and it took my British literature teacher, my 11th grade teacher, who got me back into writing. Because she said, I could weave these wonderful stories and tell stories, but it didn't translate into my writing. And when she found out why, she helped me overcome it. Mm. And also 
I started doing it out of spite for that ninth grade teacher. <laughs> uh, but it was basically being told that I wasn't good enough, I wasn't good enough, I wasn't good enough, and never how to improve. Right. I had impeccable spelling because we did spelling tests constantly. I had decent grammar. I had a problem with a learning disability that was undiagnosed. Right. That we didn't know about. And I, it's, uh, it's called dysgraphia, which is when I write, it doesn't, my brain is going so fast that it just turns into a line on the paper. It doesn't turn into words. And add that to the dyslexia, it gets even more fun. Right. But it was the fact that they didn't, they didn't work to fix it or they didn't give constructive feedback. And one of the ones, one of the uh, writing tests, and this one still enrages me to this day, um, was tell about a time, it was tell about a time you told a lie. And they were expecting you to tell a story type thing. And I actually was honest and I told about the time I shoplifted when I was little and the experiences and everything. And I got back straight ones and the best you can get is a five. And I was like, I was brutally honest. I poured my heart into this and you're not even going to tell me why you scored me with ones. And so Two months later, of course, we get another writing assessment. And I remember being pulled out of the classroom because the teacher was becoming concerned because it, it was a basically a folded piece of paper and you're given, you have to handwrite it obviously, but you're given about two and a half pages to write. And I had already gone up to the front and gotten five more sheets of paper. <laughs> This was a diatribe at these people and they refused to grade it because it wasn't on the topic. And I was like, you guys suck. And my, my British literature teacher, she read it and went, you have no grammatical errors. You have a few sentence structure errors, maybe, and a couple spelling errors. They really should grade this. They never did. She said I would have scored all fives, but I use profanities. <laughs> <laughs> she even went, do you know what this one means? And I'm like, no, I've just heard it. So I threw it in there because I, I didn't know what the word fuck meant until I was in college. Sheltered. Mm -hmm. she said, yeah. Yeah, I think, well, again, you know, my, I can't really relate to that, to that experience, but um, in terms of like learning how to write on an academic level, it's, and I, and I don't know, like, you know, your experience with writing, but I kind of have the feeling that for most people who write, uh, writing is a painful process in that it's a, you, you're constantly producing something, right? You're, you're trying to, especially when you're telling a story and even academic papers, things that are published in journals, ultimately they're a story. They're a story about a discovery or they're a story about a theoretical development or something. But you have to start at the beginning and introduce the characters or the concepts. And then you kind of have to give it a little bit of a plot. You have to show why it's important and why people should care. And then you sort of dazzle them with the stuff that you tell them that makes the, and then you reach your conclusion, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that process, it's actually quite taxing to write um, that a whole story out like that in a way that's really clear and that because you have an idea in your head of what you want to communicate and you you read it and you see what you already understand the difficult part is stepping back and going okay what if i didn't know anything about this how do i how do i approach this with fresh eyes given how close i am to it and i think this is why sometimes academic articles don't come out for a really long time that because peer review takes a while but you almost need to like write it the first time and then put it away for a few months and then come back to it when you don't have all of those ideas right fresh in your mind and read it and see if it still makes sense, you know, and, and then you can kind of see with, with clarity. But getting those ideas out in a, in a coherent way, I had a, a friend who was finishing up her PhD and she had to write the introduction because the last thing you write 
um, is the introduction <laughs> uh, because you have to tell the whole story and get to the conclusion and, and see how, you know, how it all ends up by the time you're done with it before you can actually describe what's in the thing that you've just written. And she was very much struggling with how to summarize it and organize it. Uh, and she sat at her computer and just couldn't get it done. And so I went over for tea with, one afternoon and I got my phone out and my recorder and we sat at her kitchen table and I said, tell me the story of your thesis just you know start talking and she started talking and explaining it and describing some of the concepts and I'd say okay well, what do you mean by that and she would you know explain it and and through the course of explaining it to me she actually got the bare bones of her introduction she didn't just like transcribe what she had said during the recording because I gave her the recording but it was it was easier to kind of explain it to another person than it was to just sit down and write it cold and do it all in your in our head and so yeah the, the ways that you kind of have to try to work around the problems of writing in order to write is one of the things that i learned during the course of of doing my phd yeah um my my technical writing teacher actually set up a rule when because i i had to take um i i breezed through college composition but I needed one more writing class to get my transfer degree. And so I decided to take technical writing because it was the only one that they would count. I wanted to take like one of the other writing, but they wouldn't accept it towards my degree. So I took technical writing and she said on the very first day that there was one word we were not allowed to use in our, our work. And that was the word thing. And it was, it, it actually was really difficult because you realize how often you use the word to replace whatever you're using. I almost did it there, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I wound up writing it on, uh, well, I started writing a book on writing a book and I, I remember just struggling through it, struggling through it. And she said, well, describe how it feels when you're writing a book and the struggles that you went through. 80 pages later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the, the longest chapter was on dealing with writer's block of all things, but yeah, it was, it was just that weird, don't use the word thing. Mm -hmm. And now, even today, I, I notice myself when I use it and I'll try and stop and find a different word. Well, I know that I've gotten the complaint that I use too many big words on my channel. And my, you know, and you've had similar complaints. And the thing is that compared to what I write, you know, for my job, I, I, this is like letting my hair down on my channel. I'm relaxed in the language that I use on my channel. And then sometimes I still use conceptual terms that are accurate in the discipline because it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, the, 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 you know, when you have to construct sentences clearly in order to convey an idea precisely to a reader, that requires a certain level of discipline of language as well. And I think uh, people who do those criticisms, I, I can only imagine that they don't have to write or, you know, on a, they don't write on a daily basis. And I don't mean like text message and emails, but an organized piece of writing that has a that is intended to convey an idea or information in a precise way to another person so that they understand what you mean. You know, you're trying to do kind of like, you know, mind projection of what's in your head to somebody else and have that accurate image come up in their minds as well. When you start to do that on a regular basis, then yeah, I think you you know you get a bigger vocabulary because you can't just use the same words over and over. It's going to get boring. Um, you have different ways of describing things, and so yeah, um, we do a lot of writing, but we don't do a lot of restrained, restricted, as you said. Mm -hmm. Do do it do something where you can't use a word, or you have to do it in a certain specific way. You know. Yeah, and it's it brings it back to the whole religion thing is you, you start to, as, as a writer or as an author or somebody who has to write on a regular basis, 
if you then go and look at things like looking at, let's use the Bible, for example, you, you start to see all of these words that are just thrown in there to make it, it, it's almost like you're trying to pad, pad the length of it. It's like the, the high school student, again, going to the thesaurus and throwing in words or the anti-feminist YouTube commenter who went to the thesaurus. So he didn't say the same thing as everybody else. <laughs> well, Hey, there's effort there at least. So, yeah, I perambulated actually, down the, down the walkway towards the delicatessen. Okay. You walked down the street to the deli. Yep. <laughs> so speaking of the Bible, uh, I wanted to talk about this too, because well, my experience of like learning about the Bible, I was very much an autodidact. So I started with my journey away from Catholicism and monotheism. And I read Jack Miles and I got into a lot of the authors of the Jesus Seminar, um, Marcus Borg, Paula Fredrickson, um, uh, uh, John Dominican Crossan. I read High Maccabee. He's, a, he's not mentioned very often. I don't know how the scholarly community views him. He's actually a Jewish expert who has a very Jewish take on Jesus. That was the first time I'd really been introduced to a non-Christian view of Jesus. So he was he was a fascinating author. I've got one of his books that's out of print. It's it's hard, unfortunately, to get a hold of him now. But uh, then I, I found Bart Ehrman. And I've read pretty much everything he's ever written. And I've probably watched, I know I've watched almost everything that he's that is of him on YouTube because I appreciate him as a scholar so much. He, and um, he's not a great orator, but he's friendly enough and engaging enough where, you know, I, I can listen to him for a long period of time. But as a, as a thinker and as a critic of text and doing analysis, he's, he's really sharp and he's, uh, which is what I respect the most, he's really guided by a, a, an honest pursuit of as close as we can get to a factual truth. Um, through the the centuries and layers of centuries that we have to to peer through and so his perspective in particular is is quite uh, profound in terms of how I view the text but there's also Professor Christine Hayes who has the YouTube series that's done by um, one of the Ivy League universities I want to say it's the Yale course and Dale Martin has one on the New Testament as well but I always come back to Bart at the end of the day he's my favorite biblical scholar and like him, my, my favorite book of the Bible is Mark, uh, because it's kind of sad because Mark's is, this, is the first gospel, but John gets a lot of the attention because of the theology in it. But I really like the Jesus of Mark, and I like the adoptionist start of it. Uh, well, and I also like that, you know, the opening lines of Mark, when they try to quote one of the prophets, they get the prophet wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, yeah, the Jesus of Mark is is very reticent. He, he keeps the idea that he's the Messiah a secret, or he wants to try to keep it a secret. And and he is the one who, um, during his trial in Mark, he, he doesn't say anything when he's calling his cross you know he's he's silent when he's being nailed to the cross and hoisted up he's silent and then at the very end he shouts out Eloi, Eloi, lama sabbathaka or whatever it is in in aramaic my god my god what have you why have you forsaken me and then he dies and that's it we don't see jesus again in mark we mm -hmm. hear about the empty tomb but there's no resurrection um story that we have that's come down in any of our extant the extant literature and and so I find that story actually really compelling, not as theology, but as a contrast to the Jesus that's put up by modern Christianity. And so finding this little historical gem, you know, I mean, Mark was the first gospel to be written. Um, it's not done in a very sophisticated Greek. He's, the author seems familiar with the language, but he doesn't have the rhetoric, rhetorical skills that, say, John has later on. And you can tell in Mark there are certain passages, passages where repetitively you'll be going down and they'll say suddenly he did this and, and they tell a little story and then they'll go along and tell another story and then you know or, and, and a second story and then a paragraph will start suddenly and you see these sort of like it looks like little stories that have been woven together to form the narrative from earlier story oral tradition that was being written down not like it was um, the Odyssey which is you know a contiguous piece of writing by the same author and so I think, yeah, from my my perspective, I think the John is is I'm sorry, uh, Mark is 
my favorite gospel um, to to study and to investigate. But I wanted to get yeah your take if 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 there were any of the gospels that that you appreciated a lot um, or still feel you know like you like more than others or enjoy more than others. Um. Well, the the way that I actually came about it is sort of different. Is I came about it coming from looking at mythology, going to the Bible, uh, where I was sitting there going, well, okay, this myth is here, and like uh, the main big one that everybody knows, I hope, is Genesis compared to the Epic of Gilgamesh, and how there were so many similarities, it's basically picked up and copied from one to the other, uh, the Ten Commandments and the Code of Hammurabi, things like that. And, uh, Proverbs, Proverbs yeah. is uh, lifted from Egyptian wisdom literature. Mm -hmm. That one is another big one. Uh, and so, looking at looking at all of that, that's how I started looking at the Bible. And uh, when I was when I was younger, when I was still going more to church and stuff with my family, when it was the time for the sermon part. I'd get bored and so I'd start reading the Bible. And I always, for who knows what reason, would flip to Revelations. <laughs> it was like divine mandate, read Revelation type thing was the joke that I've always used. Okay. Because it was never anywhere else in the Bible that I would flip to. It was always, I'd open it and it was right there at the start of Revelation. And I would be like, let's read something else. Oh, this is boring. Back to Revelation. <laughs> but, um, when I really started looking at it, not so much even critically, but just to read it, to read it, um, I enjoyed Genesis because it felt, and it, it's more of a funny way, because it felt like they were trying to cram so much into one chunk of the Bible. It was like, let's cram this story and this story and this story. It, it was, uh, God, how... I, I just described it yesterday to somebody. Uh, it was like the Reader's Digest condensed books <laughs> right. versus the other chapters and books of the Bible were all about like one person or there were two books about one person. Yeah. This was the abridged version to catch up to where we are. Previously on the Bible. Yeah, previously. <laughs> <laughs> where Satan looks like Obama for some reason. Oh, I finally watched that series and it was like, oh, oh my God, they made Obama into Satan. <laughs> that is one white Jesus. But um, I would say favorite books though, uh, actually are the apocryphal texts for me because okay. they, I don't really have, aside from Genesis just being amusing to me, uh, it was always the apocryphal texts, even in uh, even in the Jewish apocrypha, that fascinated me because it was like, why didn't these get included? What message are these telling that wasn't what the uh, the main religion wanted? Sort of thing. It was like, why was this one not chosen? And there was a lot of really telling stuff in it. Um, I'm actually combing through, I, I managed to get a copy of the gospel of, uh, Thomas, the gospel of Mary Magdalene and the gospel of Judas are three do that you, I just got hold of. Yeah. Do you know the website earlychristianwritings.com? No. It's fabulous. I've been using it for like a decade when I used to mm -hmm. debate Christians on debate boards back in like the early 2000s. But it is, um, it puts everything in chronological order, everything that's a Christian writing, um, even like Thecla and the um, the revelation of Peter, or the, the apocalypse of Peter, or whatever else, the shepherd of Hermas, all of that stuff. They, they have the scholarly like uh, some scholarly opinions on when it was written, um, who the author might have been, and if it's a letter to someone, what the, their life was. And then they often have links to where you can read it. So if you go to earlychristianwritings.com, you're going to just be in, um, you know, a non deist believing heaven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like looking at the, the books on my desk. It's like, how do you, it's 
Photoshop or photo. Yeah, it's Photoshop basically is the main book. And then there's like five books on myths and legends. And then there's the sarcasm dictionary. And right. It's like, gee, I wonder what I like to read. Um, <laughs> but um, I remember one of the fun, because I've, I've always been fascinated by the different translations, <laughs> quote, translations of the Bible. And it's actually, I did a video on it explaining why I use the Young's literal translation, which is pretty much he I like that one too. I really literally. like that one too. Yeah, I like the I like Young's. Yeah. Yeah, because I was looking at the King James and how flowery and pretty it looked. And then I went, there's the word unicorn in there. And I went to Bible Gateway and I went and I checked and that was the only one that said unicorn. And of course, then the later King James versions, they changed it to Beast of Burden because you need to get rid of unicorn. So it was, it was always fascinating. And uh, I think when I was 17, I found the Gnostic Bible, which was exceptionally fascinating to read because it was, it wasn't so much, okay, all this supernatural stuff. It was, it was more of the mystery religion style um instead yeah, yeah. of gnostics yeah. being a mystery religion yeah definitely and so i've i've always enjoyed that um are you familiar with airman i know the name yeah you should i think because he talks about gnostic belief systems and the the cosmic sort of duality and the various levels of god 66 levels and everything else and what they currently understand i think you'd really really like um like his talks because um he's really an expert in the various beliefs that were, you know, popular in first century Palestine and in the Roman world, I guess, you know, uh, generally. So yeah, you should, you should definitely check them out, I think. Um, and, yeah. and Young's, just as long as it, there's a pause in the conversation, I'm already mm -hmm. talking anyway. The one that really stands out to me in Young's literal translation, there is a, a part of uh, a letter from Paul I want to say it's um, the Philippians, but there's a line in there where he talks about like the son of God dwelled in me or something along those lines. And it always said dwell in all of the translation I saw, except for Young's. He used the word tabernacle. And that to me was really fascinating because I had been reading Karen Armstrong in her earlier chapters when she doesn't go kind of like off, off the topic of historian and more into her agenda. But the tabernacle was the physical place where the where god resided you know early judaism uh, god occupied physical space you know he he was in the sacred area that's why it was the purity laws got more intense and then there was the holy of holies and then that's the closest you could get to god and that they had a tent they used to move god around <laughs> when they would travel and things so we have to understand that mindset that word tabernacle meant a physical dwelling place where the spirit of god was you know the closest to people mm -hmm. and that particular word if if the actual word in the original language if he chose the word tabernacle as a jew this has a really profound profoundly different meaning than the word dwell does in English because you know the spirit of America can dwell in you but that's not the kind of physical embodiment that the word tabernacle would convey to a Jew of that time and to the Jews who had you know kept the you know translated the texts so yeah I think the variations in translations is is a fascinating topic and it's not about the theology of you know was Jesus God or not so much as for me about how people were thinking about things and the different viewpoints and trying to get it as right as we can to try to get as close we can to the the author's original you know what he was trying to convey yeah um that because i actually did one of my videos was i think it was dude where's my lucifer and of course obviously it's playing on dude where's my car but it was talking about yeah. how everybody is trying it, the current christians are trying to put Satan in the Garden of Eden, or they're trying to say that Lucifer is Satan and all this stuff. And if you actually sit there and read it, and you read it in context instead of cherry picking, which is something that they accuse skeptics and atheists of doing constantly. Um, but if you actually read 
like the uh the part about he tried to he tried to like the morning star go ahead of god type thing it's talking about nebuchadnezzar and how he tried to say he was more important than god because he could go in front of the sun rising basically the morning star rose before the sun and i'm sitting there going how dishonest do you have to be to cherry pick that out and then hide what it was actually meaning and it's it's one of the lines that i use actually to base how well i'm going to be able to get along with a christian person it's like okay this is what this means in context what do you think of this oh well it means da, 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 or no you're absolutely wrong okay you're going that way <laughs> right it's interesting to me the way that uh, sort of 21st century society or modern media have reinterpreted that story every time it's been pick it up well not every time but in two instances in particular so i'm going to go all like geek here and say that i was a fan of supernatural uh okay. the uh, and I, for me i'm a purist it's like the first five seasons because that is the like the five act play where it kind of wraps up um and there's also the new series that started which was lucifer and of course historically you know in christian mythology Lucifer, Satan, it was a morality tale. It was about uh, don't be too arrogant or whatever it, w it was, you know, he was being made an example of. He was the reason why there was suffering in the world. But in our modern day where we don't face plagues on the level that they did in the 14th century and our lifespans are about three times as long <laughs> as they were 500 years ago. Uh, in Supernatural and in Lucifer, the way that the story of of Lucifer and Yahweh play out inevitably is a family dynamic of children and their parents. And the story ends up really exploring human relationships more than supernatural ones. And I think that that's a, it's an interesting development in the way that we, or some people, should we say, uh, try to um, take really uh, long existing archetypes and bring them into a story in a way that makes sense for a modern audience. Because we don't kind of have that trembling before God because we think an earthquake is a sign that he's upset with us. God isn't that manifestly present um, in modern life. So in order to relate to the characters, they become ever more human. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's also, um, and this is gonna be my end of the Bible geek out bit, uh, is, the in the old testament god was responsible for both good and evil uh isaiah 45 7 actually yeah. says that i bring the light and the darkness i bring good and create evil yeah <laughs> and it's it's the whole thing of when you get to the new testament and then you get into the 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 pauline doctrines basically and everything like that all of a sudden god is this good person and you need so, you need the boogeyman you need the evil and it can't be god anymore because that would mean that god is the reason for suffering and god is supposed to be light and love and all this yeah. shiny fluffy bunny stuff and it can't be marcion you can't yeah. have the old god the old testament god and a new testament god because that would be heresy mm -hmm. and so all of a sudden this character shows up and it's like it's almost like watching a, a tv series and all of a sudden this really complex character gets shoehorned into a position and a new character gets put in place to be the other side of them. Uh, House was kind of like that in the later series where it was in the beginning, it was this really complex character for House. And then all of a sudden he became the good anti-hero and there was always this perfect bad guy for him to go against. And it was like, yeah, that, oh, sorry, yeah. you finished that. Go. Yeah. Um, that's basically what it happened in the Bible is, and then, as I said, the Pauline doctrines and all the fun stuff, the Peter, John, Paul, George, and Ringo crap. Uh, it basically was, we need an enemy. We need a boogeyman. We need, we need to whitewash. We need to remove the bad side of this guy and make him, make him into the good guy. And to do and, that, we need. 
yeah, sorry. I was just like, oh. I'm so because Yeah, there's a um, what what set that up to the transition between, let's say, you know, old school ancient Judaism and and the part before Christianity arose was Jewish apocalypse, um, Jewish apocalypticism, which accentuated the duality of the material versus the spiritual and the idea that um, this world was the place where evil had power, but God was still good and God was going to come down and intervene in human history through his Messiah and set up his kingdom in uh, Jerusalem, where the whole world would then, you know, worship the one true God. And so, yeah, that, so the Jewish religion at that point, and that wasn't all Jews, because there was a variety of beliefs about Jewish beliefs as there have been throughout history and there are now, but for apocalypticists who were part of the Jesus movement, then, you know, bringing in that um, Jewish perspective, which had, uh, can be represented, it's represented in Daniel, that kind of revelation approach from the Jewish side was then mixed with people who were pagans, you know, Romans and, and Greeks and whatnot, who had no idea of Jewish tradition, no idea of the Jewish language or, you know, how these things were interpreted throughout history, their historical context, and placing them in a, in a, a, a pagan background lens and, and looking at it. And then, yeah, it's very easy to, to, to get the personalities there that aren't true to Judaism and aren't also found in, let's say, Roman religions. But when you bring them kind of together, it, it sort of has the right conditions for this emergence of a, a dual, of this conflict mm -hmm. between good and evil. Well, it it's also, um, and I'll probably go into this later on a different video on my channel. Uh, basically, it's the polytheism of the original Judaism, which you can read if you read the Pentateuch, the Torah, all of those. Yeah. You said uh, I sit at my council and you're the highest gods among all the gods. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the the Elohim, the Yahweh, all of those, Baal, all the yeah. different gods. Asherah. And then it goes into, yeah, Ashra. Oh, God, I wanted to do a video on her. And by the time I was done researching, it would have been like a 27-part series. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I could have written a doctoral dissertation on her <laughs> with how much I had. Uh, but yeah, the, the removal of the pantheistic gods and then the adopting of the war god, Yahweh, and then the moving back to a pantheistic setting of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, which it's, it's kind of, to use Tim's joke, it's uh, it's a binary of three. It's a singularity <laughs> of three. Yes. It's it's like they're all one, but they're not because this and because reasons. Because reasons. Yeah. mystery. Yeah, and it was like so. You you can watch, and then if you stick that on history, and you watch the ebb and flow of religious beliefs. You can watch it go from polytheistic to sort of a monotheistic following one specific god for a while to kind of getting back into the fold of the polytheistic gods and into the Roman era with lots of polytheism. And then going down into a singular god to help with control. And it's like, oh, the Bible suddenly makes a whole lot more sense, but not in a religious aspect, more of a how did the humans explain stuff aspect. Right, historical, mm -hmm. yeah, and that's why it's it's fascinating. Not because for me, it's it's. I mean, I know to many people it's a holy text, but for me, it's a it's a history book. In the same way that you know um, what Caesar wrote, and his I don't know if they're called chronicles or whatever else, but you know his writings are incredibly precious because you have a first person account of. Um, people, how people thought about things in that day and their value systems and how they understood the world and what was important to them, you know, honor and, and all these kinds of things, what it meant to be a Roman in mm -hmm. to, to the mind of Caesar or what he wanted people to think he thought, you know, because again, <laughs> these are as much propaganda sometimes it's, you know, you're putting, you're writing to an audience, you're not writing your private letters in this case. So um, yeah, it is, a, it's a, it's a fascinating book. And I think in, a, in many ways, people who who use the Bible as a form of worship they actually don't get as much out of it because they're only seeing it in one way. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, when you, I, I saw some videos where they're like, okay, we're going to do Bible study and now we're going to think about a question that's really meaningful to us. And then we're going to go look up this passage 
that's going to speak to us. I'm like, well, that's just fortune telling. That's yeah. just, you know, tarot cards with, with more pages and less pictures. And I've had better accuracy with tarot readings than <laughs> yeah. it's, it is, it's interpretation. Um, one of the, one of the things that was always fun with the whole, with the whole Bible study and everything is, um, God, who was it? Oh, it was, uh, the Bible Reloaded guys, uh, Hugo and Jake had been told that they were reading the Bible wrong. And then Wooly Bumblebee got in on it because it was a uh, Dean Esme freaked out over it. And yeah, he's a Why? piece of, I have oh. no idea how he got into it, but he basically was telling, cause I was having a conversation, Wooly Bumblebee got in on it, Hugo and Jake, we were all talking on Twitter and he jumped in and was like, you were reading the Bible wrong. And so I actually looked and I was like, wait a second, there's, there was something that we talked about in seminary. What was, it? oh, right, we have a calendar of what we're supposed to read on what day in what order. And so I pulled it up and yeah, you can't, you are, if you read the Bible, this is the justification that the Christians use now as to why the atheists are wrong or the a-religious or the agnostics, whatever. You cannot read the Bible cover to cover because it's not in the proper order for understanding. Oh. There is a specific there is a specific order that you have to read it in and it generally starts with John. And then you jump back and then you jump for and it's like this weird jumping around to create this story and if you if you actually look at it, you're leaving out huge chunks. So it, it removes all these different pieces that don't uh, don't they coincide with the narrative. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, uh, even, even today, I can still remember the main schedule that they had at church, which was obviously you discussed Easter at Easter time, Christmas at Christmas time, even if that wasn't the section of the Bible you were discussing. Um, Passover, you discuss Moses and all that stuff. And learning the history of Passover was traumatizing at the age of seven. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah, that was how that you movie. didn't kill people. <laughs> Um, but there was a very specific schedule. It was like at this date you read from first Kings at this date, you read from Malachi at this date, you read from Isaiah and it, it was never in order. So it was, it was actually really interesting to realize that if you read it cover to cover, you're reading it wrong. And that's why you're an atheist because God has intentionally, what was it? God has intentionally made it confusing unless you have been given the proper path to understanding. Because he wants everyone to come, so he puts the book chapters in the wrong order. <laughs> I was like, God, if I if I wrote my book in the wrong <laughs> chapter order, I wouldn't make any sales. And this person's top seller, oh, that's because the Gideons keep buying stuff. Yeah, that's why I really enjoy Ehrman, because he treats each author as an individual voice. And mm -hmm. when you read, as you say, in church, you're picking, taking passages, you know, here and there. And even if you just sort of like read, um, start at the beginning of Mark and read all of Mark, and then you go to Matthew and you read all of Matthew and you go to Luke and you read all of Luke, that's still not really giving you the sense of the different voices. What you should do is, you know, read the first paragraph of Mark and then the first paragraph of Luke and the first paragraph. If you read them in that way, you start to see that the author's start different places, they organize their information in different ways, they have different themes, they have different uh, um, you know, elements of the story that they expand or change or whatever else. And so it's not just about reading up and down and, and across, you kind of have to read them a little bit against each other, realizing that every author had an audience in mind, and it wasn't you. So, mm -hmm. you know, what is what is the author trying to say to his specific audience? And if you look at Matthew, I mean, Matthew is the most Jewish gospel there is. That's the one where Jesus says, unless you like have the righteousness or something of the Pharisees and the scribes, you won't get into heaven um, or something along those lines. Or you have to they have to even though they sit on the seat of Moses, you know, um, you should still listen to them, even if they're not perfect or whatever else. And that's completely different from Luke's agenda, which is completely different from what Mark is trying to say about the reticent Jesus, which is completely different than the Greek orator that Jesus becomes in John. And seeing all of these different Jesuses, according to what the author was creating for his audience, 
I think is, is far more interesting than just homogenized, blended Jesus, where you take a little bit of Luke and a little bit of Matthew and you create uh, a story of the nativity that never happened even in the texts. We've completely constructed the story by mashing together bits of Luke and Matthew and completely ignore, you know, overlooking the fact that Mark doesn't have a birth narrative and ne neither does John because they have different ideas of when Jesus was God. Mark, when he was adopted at the baptism and John, he coexisted with God. So he didn't, so who cares about how he was born, you know? Um, and this to me, that's the exciting stuff about the Bible. That's the fascinating gems that are inside. And that's why I think I keep coming back to it as a text, not because of um, uh, claims of divinity, but more because of the intricacies that are available to be teased out when you start to know how to pay attention to the differences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, I was actually laughing because I have a book. It's somewhere in here, and it's actually the proper way to read the Bible. And it actually tells you from left to right. <laughs> it, it actually tells you it's a really like short book. <laughs> yeah, it it tells you like you need to pray first before opening God's word, and like don't read large amounts of text. Uh, take breaks often. Let's see. Harvey is looking at me. <laughs> He's like, really? Well, then again, Harvey went to a Catholic seminary before he got kicked out. All right. Yeah. So both of us are religious scholars. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just, it's amazing the mental gymnastics that they, they push. And you don't really see it in other, so much in other religious texts or religions even of no this isn't the right way we know the right way now well aside from scientology but uh the the, the whole thing is it's like okay we can't take it on face value we need these special things now and the gutenberg printing press and everything brought it to the common man and then now we have this whole nother way that we have to do it because now every man can understand it, but we can't let every man understand it because we'll be out of a job. Well, Chris, tell them about the uh, Bible dictionaries. Oh God, the Bible dictionaries. Where everything <laughs> in the Bible has a different meaning from regular text. All right, because words don't mean words anymore. <laughs> yeah, words don't mean words. Or how or or. The theologian's guide to the bible or the other fucking giant libraries that you need to read this little <laughs> fucking book that's all about social goddamn control <laughs> okay harvey breathe <laughs> i'm not gonna dispute that yeah no both of us i mean he grew up religious i didn't so and he was actually going to be a priest and everything until he dis discovered what was it you like sex more than that <laughs> I like sex with females a lot more than little boys <laughs> he was going to be catholic um that and he asked too many questions so they kicked him out i don't know if you guys have seen the bbc but series why do we need a separate dictionary for what we're reading because God's word is interpreted different than what we're supposed to be learning. <laughs> we push the Harvey button. <laughs> Don't read believe here. that text in front of you. Here, read this text to understand that text. Yeah. But um, yeah, I was watching uh, Wolf Hall, this BBC series. Mark Rylance, I think, is the guy's name who stars in it. You guys should check it out. It's it's really fantastically done. It's done in the time of Henry VIII, when obviously religion was a very big issue for their political system. And you know, they have scenes in there where they have the Catholic priests reciting the Mass in Latin, and you hear it from time to time. And then there's you know, this push to people who want to read it in their own language. And again, I mean, I'm not a big proponent of the Bible, but what I appreciate is that spirit of people saying, look, these words are meaningless to me. It's all just noise and ritual and stuff. And, and it's right there in a book and you can read it because you've had training, but I can't read it because it's not in my language. Mm -hmm. And I want to have that. And there's a really like, powerful scene where a, a guy is um, sitting in church and the priest is in front with his back to the congregation. He's reciting things in Latin. And he's got 
an English copy of the Bible in his hands and his hands are just trembling because what he's about to do could get him burned at the stake. And he stands up and he starts to read from John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And, I mean, I don't think it matters what your belief system is. There is a certain kind of poetry that English can achieve. And, you know, the King James has some really poetic English language, even if it's not translated accurately. But to the, the reactions, too, of the actors in the scene to this guy turning around and you know, hearing these words and realizing what he had, was doing. He was reading the word of God in English. And that was an act of revolution. It, it again, made me realize the extent to which Catholic, the Catholic uh, Church has tried to control people since the very beginning. And the, the way you deny people any autonomy is to deny them knowledge. Deny, and religion played such a massive part in everybody's life. It controlled the monasteries, you know, uh, the church owned vast tracts of land and were landholders and everything else. So for them to keep all of this special knowledge and then dole it out in instructions and always be the middleman, I can... I can, there's not a lot, so there's a lot of problems I have with Martin Luther, Luther he was cr incredibly anti-Semitic and everything else, but the movement to get that knowledge in a way that more people could understand it, I think to me that's the impressive part of the Protestant revolution, not so much that it challenged, say, the worship of saints or the, you know, the idea of transubstantiation. To me, what was important about it was it was the demand of people who wanted access to that knowledge and that to me is like a, a an important step in human history mm -hmm. yeah and probably for another time i can discuss uh the connections with that with a couple other religions uh because it is it's basically we know how to read it properly even though it's now accessible to you without our help guiding you you won't understand it here's a dictionary use this dictionary before you read that mm -hmm. thing so you read it right <laughs> yeah um don't think for yourself it's, I think I just hit the Harvey button again. Um, <laughs> uh, well, because he's studied a lot of religions as well, and he knows sure. exactly which religion I'm referring to on that one. Uh, so, um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's honestly amazing. It's fascinating from a psychological and sociological perspective, just how religion works and it, you can see it in, in cult leaders, the things that are used. And I think there was a comic, it's basically uh, one man spouting gibberish is a crazy man, a few men spouting gibberish is a cult, a hundred men is a religion. Mm -hmm. And Work it's- for Mormonism. Yeah, and it, it, it is, it's basically this, we have the knowledge, we're willing to give it to you if you do X. Mm -hmm. You can go out and get it yourself, but you won't understand it properly. Only we know the proper understanding. And going back to the psychological view of that, that is, it, it's an abuse tactic. It's the only I can help you. Only I can do this for you. Only I can fix the problem. And it, it is one of those where if you look at religion with the abuse checklist or the cult checklist or all those different ones, you really start going, this is really creepy. And for some reason, we have had a helicopter flying over our house for the past, what, five days now? I'm just hearing this helicopter oh, in the window. It's like, I'm gone. The fuck is going on? But yeah, it's, it's, it's control, as Harvey said. It's, we need a way to control it. And I pulled up the quote from Dogma. It's that they took an idea and created a religion from it. They mm -hmm. took an idea and created a belief system out of it. <clears throat> because ideas are easy to change, beliefs aren't. I'm paraphrasing at this point. Yeah, I, that's but, one of the reasons I, I liked Buddha's teachings a lot, because he mm -hmm. was the only religious teacher that I'd ever come across, or at least in that point in my life, who said, look, don't believe me just because they call me the Buddha. Take what I'm telling you, try it out. If you mm -hmm. if it works, then you'll know it's true. And also the very um, famous story, the, I want to say the Kalam, where people were, came to him from a village saying, you know, should we do this because of our tradition or should we do this because the elders say it or should we do this because it was written in a book? He's like, don't do it because other people told you to do it. 
go and look at it for yourself and think, does this help people? Does it make the world a better place? Then do it. If it doesn't make the world a better place, it doesn't help people, don't do it. But don't do it because it says so in a book or because of tradition or because someone you respect to tell you to. You know, think for yourself, test these things out. And that to me, I think is one of the more radical parts of Buddhism. Of course, then it became institutionalized and it became a larger religion. But at the core, um, you know, you're not going to go to hell in Buddhism if you don't, if you decide to walk away from parts of you know, the teachings. So mm -hmm. uh, the social control and, and the religion side, that they, they ended up being mixed up in politics a bit. But at the core, at least, the guy's um, ideas were brave because he wasn't asking people to go on blind faith. He was asking them to go on experience. And I yeah. don't really know any other religion that has a founder that had that principle from the beginning. I don't know of any religions. I know of a Kenpo instructor who does that. And that was my Kenpo instructor. <laughs> I am, I am praising Doc. I'm not saying anything bad about him. I'm saying, the try it out yourself. I'm not the guru. Yeah, it's a Harvey's good very defensive about Doc. <laughs> Doc's actually a great guy. He's the one who uh, helped me a lot with my PTSD. So, oh great. But his his whole thing is this is the knowledge that I have gained from my studies i am presenting it to you don't take it on blind faith try mm -hmm. it out i'm not magic <laughs> yeah i'm not a guru i'm just a guy who reads a lot yeah. and that that's his whole thing is if he finds something out he wants to present it to you and teach it to you if he finds for a price, for a price. If, if he if he finds out like when we were taking kenpo he found out a quicker set of moves than the standard set that they're supposed to teach. And so he now teaches the difference between these, like this one's easier, this one flows better, things like that. It's the constant improvement thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, it's the don't take me on blind faith, try it out yourself. And yeah, aside from Buddhism, I don't, I think there's a few uh, naturalistic religions, the more earth pagan religions right that have it but it's it's the more deistic and pantheistic style than an actual buddha or brahmin or guru more systematized yeah well yes that kind of um more earth-based than above the earth-based shall we say yeah it's uh the one of the religions that became shintoism uh, was more of listen to the things around you, experience it, and build from it. Mm. And then it became Shintoism. Right. But uh, that's the only, Buddhism's the only one I can think of. And it's, aside from the Lotus Sutra, uh, which is the one where it says that the only way a woman can become a Buddha is if she becomes a man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it is pretty gender neutral which is something that i liked yeah i mean buddha did found the first um sort of monk um system for nuns you know he had monks but then he also had nuns and that was the first religion where there was an organized place for women i think a lot mm -hmm. of the misogyny kind of like with paul i mean paul didn't write uh timothy uh, that's a forgery that people couldn't tell the difference and th so they thought paul was wrote it and, and paul gets maligned as a misogynist more than he deserves i'm not saying he wasn't i'm saying he gets it more than he deserves because the forgeries are attributed to him and there's some uh, evidence that a lot of that the misogyny that came in came in sort of after yeah. and was accentuated but yeah in terms of women's ability to become enlightened he taught that women had the ability to become enlightened yes so yeah it's uh it's like, if you want to look at the misogyny of the disciples, Peter was the misogynist, if you look at what he says. But um, that's in the Apocrypha. Okay. Uh, it's He's the one that's very against any females learning at the foot of Jesus. He's the one who's against uh, Mary Magdalene being redeemed, even though Mary Magdalene is three women smashed into one, kind of like Asherah is removed. Thank God. And, uh, but it's, it's that whole pushing the misogynistic patriarchal view of the, uh, the priesthood back into the story, you whereas know, Jesus never, is different. 
Yeah, you never made sense to me. I wish I could ask this of Bart Ehrman one day. But it seems weird to me that in the Gospels that Peter betrays Jesus three times. And then when Jesus comes back, not in Mark, obviously, but in the other ones, he doesn't bring this up. He still makes him the, the foundation of his church. And it's never like, I forgive you for this, or Peter's like, oh, dude, I didn't mean to like betray you three times. So I'm. this just seems like a, such a break in the narrative that's never properly resolved. And I, I would really like to know what scholars think about that, because Peter failed the test. He, he really shouldn't have been the person who, who was the rock of the church, Cephas. It should have been someone who, who didn't deny him uh, when he was when push came to shove. So that little, it's like a hangnail in, in for me in the Gospels, that little bit of Peter, Peter's denial never getting resolved is like a plot point in a movie. Like, but why did they even put that in if they weren't going to do anything with it? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it, it is somewhat resolved in the Apocrypha and in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but it, yeah, it is never really covered. I mean, it's like, um, uh, I'm pro if I, I'm, I'm left-handed and I broke my left hand, go figure. So I'm not writing down notes of things I want to look up. So I'm trying to put this in memory to look up later. But um, it, it's kind of like the whole thing with Judas all of a sudden flipping in the story. Where he no, was... Actually, oh, sorry, you finished. Yeah, so yeah, he was um, with Jesus. You finished because uh, Airman has a theory on this. I'd like to bounce off of you. Yeah, um, because he was basically, he was the most loyal. He was the most he was one of the closest to Jesus, according to all the stuff you read. And then all of a sudden he flips and in the gospel of Judas, it explains, or one of the translations of the gospel of Judas explains that Jesus came to him and said, I need somebody to betray me. You're the only one I can trust. That's basically what it is. He's like, you are the strongest of, what was it, Harvey? You're the strongest one of all. I know that you can go through with this. You are the strongest of my disciples. You are the one I trust to do this for me. You need to do this so that my teachings can be, uh, uh, what was the word? My teachings can be spread. Yeah. And so it's basically the, I need you to do this for me. You're going to take the fall. You're going to be the villain, but I know you can handle it. Yeah. And those basically, are the Jesus was to be the sacrificial lamb so that his teachings can uh, be spread. Yeah. Yeah, and with the Gnostics, because that's a Gnostic gospel, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, yeah that's like, a Gnostic gospel. Yeah, the understanding, like the secret understanding of, of what was going on. So in Mark, one of the things that Ehrman points out is that in Mark's gospel, he talks about the fact that Jesus gave teachings to the public. And then he also specifically mentions that he teaches the disciples something in private, these secret teachings. And so he was said, you know, he'd always been confused in the stories where Judas shows up with the Roman soldiers and people would say, oh, well, he turned over information on where he was staying. He's like, well, the Roman soldiers wouldn't need an insider because Jesus wasn't hiding. He was out, you know, he's in public. People could see him. So that didn't make sense. And what Ehrman theorizes is that it's not that Judas told the Romans where Jesus was. What they told him was that Jesus was going around preaching in public, but in private, he was teaching that he was the Messiah and that he was going to, you know, in the next kingdom or the new kingdom of God. And that's where he becomes the traitor and that deserves the death by crucifixion. And so, um, yeah, that little uh, motivation there in terms of like these secret teachings and Judas, you know, for whatever reason, it doesn't really say so much in the text, but either you know, he didn't believe in Jesus anymore, or he decided to betray them. But this, the information that he gave them was about what he was teaching them in, in secret, which is, you know, Mark had set that up earlier in the gospel. So again, these little gems, you know, that kind of like, oh, you can put this together and it works. But the Peter thing, Peter thing doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, the Peter thing, there's a plot hole somewhere. Yeah, there's yeah. a chunk of the book that's not there. Um, Peter was an asshole. Yeah, Peter was an asshole. <laughs> Peter, uh, yes. <laughs> but um actually on my channel there's a video that actually discusses the the fall guy basically the judas story and also it it discusses judas satan and loki of all people and it's it's the the fall guy story it's i need you to take the fall to become a villain because we need a villain and you can handle it type thing 
So anybody who's interested, one of my older videos on that. <laughs> um, but yeah, the the Jesus was a teacher of the mystery religions, if you really want to go into it. So the mystery religions, uh, the cult of Dionysus, the cult of uh, Mithras, all these other cults out there at the time were also mystery religions. There was what you taught to the public, basically what we would see today as what you're taught going to church. And then there was what was taught in secret to the inner circle, or basically you go to seminary and you join the priesthood for today's comparison. Um, so the comparison for Jesus was what he spoke, the Sermon on the Mount and everything, what he spoke and preached in public versus what he taught the disciples. It was the, the outer mysteries, public, inner mysteries, the disciples. And it's the inner mysteries that uh, most people in public wanted to find out about. And this is, this is speculation by this point and stuff that I've been reading. Um, but it was the desire of the Romans to find out what these inner mysteries were. And the desire of, does he know something we don't? We need to know everything type thing. That caused them to start looking, supposedly. Yeah, I guess I kind of take the view that like there's waves of understanding of Jesus and especially in the first two centuries where you get basically the first group who were just Jews and mm -hmm. stayed Jews. And then you had Paul, well, not just Paul, because I mean, people have been going to the Gentiles before Paul, but Paul kind of decided that he was going to corner the market and declare himself the apostles to the Gentiles once he realized that he wasn't really winning over that many Jews. He's like, I'll let Peter be the gospel of the circumcised. I'll be the gospel to the uncircumcised. And but you get the, more of the pagan ideas and the mystery religions, obviously, had been operating for a very long time. Um, so I think, you know, the Gnostics represent a pagan interpretation of Jesus that maps onto the mystery religions. I think you have the Jewish, the Ebionites, who stayed Jews and got massacred in the 70 um, invasion by the Romans or, you know, died off or whatever. And then you had the Pauline version that came to predominate and became what was known as orthodoxy and then, then chased all of these other ideas away. So, you know, for me, I think it's more about at what once, you know, I think there was a historical man named Jesus. And I have to do this. I hopefully I can record it. I'm going to have a couple of days of vacation. I hope to record the series um, in by the end of the month because I started it in, in August and then just didn't do anything with it. But it's all written. I just need to sit down and record it and I haven't had time. And in so, yes, I think there was an historical man named Jesus did basically these things and then people circulated his stories and started exaggerating them. And for every community, Jesus became something different. So I think it's really difficult for us to get back too far into the actual history. There are some bits of facts, like he was Jewish, he was he preached in the Galilee, he went to Jerusalem, he was accused of treason, he was crucified. His followers didn't believed um, that he had risen from the dead and started preaching that. You know, so they're like little bits of history, but I think um, getting into it any deeper is just kind of beyond us with the documentation that we have. Yeah, it's, um, you can even see it in the Bible, as you said, going from Mark to to John. It's mm -hmm. the story becomes more and more yeah. fantastical. And even in, John actually contradicts the other three Gospels, because yeah. in the other three Gospels, Jesus is, I'm not God, I'm not, I am the son of man, I am a prophet, I'm a preacher, da 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 and then all of a sudden in John, it's, I am God! The Father and I are one, yeah. Yeah, and it's, you can just see within the same book, yeah. or the in the same Bible, you can see the progression as it gets further away from the quote-unquote source of historical Jesus. Very much so. Yeah, and, and, and our Airman has an interesting idea about Paul's theology, too, because Paul's theology for him, and I have to say for me, was always a little bit difficult to get my head around. And what he's done recently, and this is why I think you'd like it, he's got the book, How Did Jesus Become God? And he talks about the ways that the humanity and divinity overlapped in the ancient world, that humans could be elevated to a godlike status, state, gods could come down and impregnate human beings, and so you get a kind of a mix of half mortal. Um, and also at that time, the Roman emperors were adopting 
their sons, you know, um, Julius adopted Octavius, Octavius adopted uh, Tiberius, and when Caesar died, they made him into a god. So then, uh, you know, um, uh, um, Augustus became literally a son of a god. And when Augustus was a god, you know, and so then you had another path to divinity, which is, you know, you could be adopted by a god and become a son of God. And he talks about all these different ways to be divine and how these were playing in the culture at the time and how this then um, had an impact on how people saw Jesus's relationship to the divine, which is very different from our kind of binary of there is mortal and then, you know, in the divine in the sort of um, uh, monotheistic notion of a God. And, and so what Paul, what he thinks, if you look at the text, it makes a lot of sense. Paul didn't think that Jesus was one with God, one substance or, um, or one essence. It's, he talks about, though, Jesus being raised up and put above all other names. Or put above, or his name was above all other names. So it seems like Jesus was sort of, sort of like super being, super angel, that was so obedient to God that he was willing to go to, to become human and die. And because he did that, because he was so loyal and loved God so much that God elevated him to basically like just below him. <laughs> he gave him the greatest honor of putting him at his right hand. And basically, like, if you if you were in with Jesus, then you were all good with Yahweh. And that's why Paul thought you didn't need the law anymore, because you just can do an end run around the law. As for Gentiles, Jews can keep the law because they were given the law, but Gentiles could actually get to heaven just by being on good, you know, being on this guy's good side. Um, but it, it's not the kind of, it would be much more like Arianism, you know, uh, the idea that the God uh, in, was higher than Jesus and Jesus was subordinate, whereas um, current, the, the Trinity is, you know, uh, everything is co-equal. So if, if you read Paul with that understanding of Jesus being like a super angel, then the things he says about him make a lot more sense than if it's God trying to do that to himself, which is what the Trinity would have you think. Um, I, I do have to get going pretty soon, though. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I noticed. I was going to say, too, like we've been on for, for like a really long time. So if you want to wrap this up, we can do that right now, unless there's something else you want to come back on after what I just said. Um, not really. There's there's some stuff that would be a whole nother podcast, like the <laughs> fact that the Holy Ghost is almost always portrayed as a female in the Trinity, which... Mm -hmm really throws a monkey wrench into the God and Jesus and the Holy Ghost are one type thing. But yeah, <laughs> that would um, be interesting. No, I, I was Googling while you were typing so I could pull up the how did Jesus become God bit. Oh, yeah. And so I typed in how did Jesus become? And the second result was white. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it says, how did Jesus become God? How did Jesus become white? How did Jesus become Christ? How did Jesus become Christian? <laughs> <laughs> Two of those are so stupid. It makes me laugh. Yeah. How did Jesus, Jesus wasn't Christian. He was Jewish. <laughs> yeah. It's well, that and he hated the Gentiles. So, well, he never converted a Gentile. He came for a reason. Harvey. There was a God fearer. This Roman soldier was a God fearer, which meant he was a monotheist. But Jesus never told a Gentile to abandon their faith and follow him. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, um, I, we've been going forever. It's been a lovely chat. I've had as much fun as I thought we would. And if you want to hang around, I'll do the outro and then we can just say goodbye off air. So for those of you who listened all the way to the end, thank you so much for your time and attention. Thanks to Mick for coming on and, and giving his expertise and thoughts. If you want to say uh, goodbye to the people. Uh, goodbye. And if you have any suggestions, hop over to my channel. I'm always looking for new topics to cover. Yep, a link for that will be in the description box below. And until next time, I've been Christy. You have been awesome. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you again really soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I am as stubborn as We can lock our horns together and